Hi, this is Charlie Christensen for Technique One. Today we're talking about resonance. Now there's kind of two questions to start. What is resonance? And we're going to be spending the next 15 minutes or so talking about that. And what does a resonant voice sound like? So that question, what does a resonant voice sound like, is complicated. And there's a lot of different opinions on that. Uh, if you check out the Moodle page here, you'll find a couple different examples of that. But let's go to the first question. What is resonance? So there are four systems of singing. The respirator, the phonator, the resonator, and the articulator. Uh, we've already talked about two of these in depth, the resonator and the phonator. So that's uh, breathing and your vocal folds vibrating. Um, and the resonator and articulator are, uh, are related. Every instrument has some aspect of each of these. So if you're playing guitar, uh, your finger or your pick is going to be number one. That's going to get the vibration happening. Um, number two is the thing that's vibrating. So that would be the guitar string. And number three, the resonator uh, is the body of the guitar. And those, again, three and four are kind of the same thing. On a piano, the hammer would be number one, the piano string would be number two, and then the body of the piano, whether it's a grand piano or an upright piano, would be number three. Um, three and four are related to each other, and actually articulation is going to determine our resonance space. And what that means is uh, when we sing words, when we sing lyrics, that articulation of the lyrics is going to determine our resonant space. Here's a picture of our resonator, if you're a singer. So uh, you have the oral cavity, the nasal cavity, and the pharynx. The pharynx is the space between your larynx, your vocal folds, and your mouth. That kind of space, that, that tube there between your mouth and your larynx is called your pharynx. Um, and so these things are changed, this, these spaces are changed by the placement of our tongue, our jaw opening, our lip opening, uh, our soft palate. From the book, laryngeally produced sound, the result of airflow and vocal fold approximation, is modified by a mechanical acoustic filter, the vocal track. The size and shape of the track determines the nature of the filtered properties. So here again, you see another picture of your vocal track. So movements of the articulators, your tongue, your lips, affect the tube cavity and the dimensions of the vocal track. These shapes affect the resonance of your sound. And the change in the filter function affects, obviously, what we hear as the listener. Your vocal track resonator tube, again, is made up of three main parts. Two are more important than the other. Pharynx and your mouth are the most important or the most common resonators. And then sometimes your nose is involved in resonance. So if you think about people who have a very resonant uh, or a very nasal sound, uh, maybe Gwen Stefani from No Doubt, uh, who have this very kind of like nasally sound, they're using their nasal cavity as a resonating space just as much as their mouth and their pharynx. By skillfully combining the resonating cavities, vocal timbre can be controlled. The tube responds to the demands of articulation presented by vowels and consonants. So that's a little bit of a review of what we just talked about. Now we're getting into the physics of music. So we're talking about formants, and specifically the formants that determine or are involved with vowels. So all vowels have resonance, but each vowel has its own distinct pattern of resonance. Uh, that's the result of the number of frequencies and the energy distribution of the overtones that are present. It is by means of these differences in the overall patterns of resonance that we are able to hear and discriminate one vowel from another. These changing resonance patterns are produced by altering the shape and size of our vocal track. So put another way, when we change the shape of our vocal track by moving our tongue around or dropping our jaw, closing our jaw, something like that, uh, we're actually changing the number and the energy distribution of the overtone series 
of the note we're singing. And then that overtone, the, the formants that are formed by strong overtones in our sound uh, are actually, um, actually change the vowel sound that we hear. Here's another look at it. And so you can see here on the left-hand side uh, and on the bottom, on the left-hand side is frequency up and down from a low sound to a high sound. On the bottom are different vowel sounds. We'll just focus on all the way on the left. The I, the I down there on the bottom is the IPA signal for E. And so that's an E vowel. And you can see that on this pitch, there is a low formant that's pretty strong. There's kind of a mid to high and a very high formant. And that overtone series is determining that sound. And then you can see the changes in the overtone or the, the formants as you go through these different vowels. Here's a little bit better look at this. And what's really important is what's on the left. So on the left, you can see the shape of the tongue or the shape of the mouth. So the shape of your resonance space, the vowel that's corresponded to that, and then a graph that shows the formants that are related to that vowel. So you can see a really big difference between heed, which is on the top, and hood, which is on the bottom. The graph to the right of that are, is showing basically where those strong vowel formants are. And the lines are corresponding to a peak. If you think about the, um, the graph on the left as like kind of hills and valleys, that line is corresponding to a peak. So our tongue is doing a lot of this work of, of changing the vowel, also our lips. But you can see here um, the different positions of the tongue. That's what this picture is trying to show. The different positions of the tongue and how they correspond to different vowels. I don't know if you can see on the lower bottom right, uh, those are different vowels and the number corresponds to the tongue position there. Another way of looking at this is this graph that shows uh, on the left from a high to a low tongue position or from a front to a back tongue position. And these different tongue positions are going to determine the resonant space and then therefore the vowel. But there's other information. When we sing a note, uh, there's the fundamental, there's the, the pitch that we're singing. Then there's the vowel definition area, the, the vowel formants. But then there's this other information that happens when we sing. It's much higher up and it's kind of complicated, kind of smooshed together. That area up there is what we call the singer's formant. So if you ever hear anyone use that term, singer's formant, the singer's formant is what we think of as our resonance. So the the bigger our singer's formant is, and this a certain um, a certain alignment of the singer's formant is going to make some people feel like, oh, they have a lot of resonance, or they have quote unquote good resonance. But the singer's formant is really affecting our timbre. So this is what this is how we can discern one voice from another. If you and I are both singing this exact same frequency on the exact same vowel or close to it. Uh, it'll still sound different. Our two voices will still sound different, and that's because we both have a slightly different uh, vocal track, and uh, that's going to change the singer's formant, so that information up there. And what's kind of cool is, if, if you think about it, those higher formants, those really higher formants, um, are affected by the low formant. Just a little change in, in, any, in any of the sound on a fundamental level can change the formant in a, in a really big way, because it's just kind of like math. It's like a multitude kind of a thing. And so, uh, so that's how you have these wild different sounds that we can make. Uh, so this is also what we can, what we, uh, oftentimes think of as quality. So timbre, um, or how much resonance, and this is again, how we can tell one voice from another. Now there's another term that's used all the time and that's placement. And so how is this different than resonance? Well, um, I think it mostly has to do with, and there's probably a lot of things it has to do with, but I think it has, mostly has to do with our soft palate. So if you think about just the vowel E, if my soft palate is down, this is what my E vowel sounds like. E. Now if my soft palate is raised, like I'm yawning, it sounds like this. E. Now we would think of those two sounds as a forward place sound. That's with my soft palate down. E. And a back placement. E. In classical music, we're generally uh, generally taught to kind of lift our soft palate just a little bit to give us more resonant space. And so that would be kind of a, a, a more backwards placement. The reason why it's called placement is because we actually feel like it's coming from a different part of our head almost. Um, 
And so this is really different than resonant because I can have a very I can have a very resonant forward placement or a very not resonant forward placement and vice versa. And there's a lot of different kind of colors to resonance, right? You have a lot of different timbres um, and different placements. So these kind of things are kind of independent terms. A lot of times though they get kind of mixed up and almost thought of as the same thing. Uh, but it's important to remember that they're all just different aspects of kind of the same thing, which is our resonance space. Um, some helpful tips when you're exploring your resonance, and it's important to think about it like exploring your resonance, not necessarily uh, perfecting your resonance or something like that, because uh, in classical music, it may be true that there is one golden standard that uh, that we're all trying to achieve as far as resonance space goes. But in contemporary music, it's much more about uh, using different colors and what the right color is for the right situation, the right music, the right mood, all of that kind of stuff. So here are some tips to explore your resonant space and uh, see kind of what colors you can paint with. Uh, humming, using different vowel positions, trying things in different registers, um, trying to achieve jaw and tongue freedom, so uh, reducing tension in those areas. Uh, trying different uh, spaces, so having a high larynx position, how does that change your resonant space? Because it's changing the shape of your instrument. Uh, how breathy is your tone? And trying to separate uh, volume from intensity. So volume is mostly about the amplitude of your vocal folds, which uh, has to do with a lot of different things, but it's usually related to breath pressure. Intensity is more of a resonance kind of a concept. So really separating those. Can you have more resonance or less resonance with the same volume, with the same breath pressure? Uh, some speaking exercises to explore your resonance space. These mostly have M's in them or N's, uh, which kind of really help you uh, feel very resonant in your head because they're nasal. So we climbed and climbed. Repeat after me. Glimmer, glimmer, glitter, gleam. Calm and smooth as music murmuring. Alone, alone, all, all alone, alone on a wide, wide sea. The birds on the wing, it's spring, it's spring. So that's your intro to resonance. I look forward to reading your reflections and discussing this topic in class. Thank you.